So hi, Farnham Street School. Um, I'm super lucky that I've been hearing you guys do your classes for the last eight weeks now. So I have a, a good idea of what you've been covering. And so hopefully I can relate this to uh, this presentation to what you've been learning with Julia. And also um, I'm Milo's mom. So I have the inside track on what makes a good presentation for the school. So today I'm gonna be talking about mental models. And um, before we get started, I'll just give you a tiny little bit of background on who I am. Other than being Milo's mom, um, I work with Shana Farnham Street and my two main jobs are writing articles for the blog and just kind of organizing the process for getting stuff up on the blog. And then I also write the mental models books. So that's why I'm gonna to talk to you about mental models today. So first slide, oops, oh work there we go so what are mental models so um, one of the things I asked Julia to do is have you guys read from our website um, our, our background on our mental models page just to get you started thinking about mental models so they are ideas we all have about how the world is and we all have them and what happens is when you're young you probably don't remember being a baby none of us do but when you're little, you learn sort of isolated facts, right? You learn that like a stove is hot or that fishy crackers taste good. Um, and then as you grow up, you start making connections about um, different ideas and how they relate together. So if you think about maybe you start observing in the world and you see that like uh, a tree has green leaves and grass is green and you know and you see flowers and they have green leaves and you know that these things are all plants then you probably start to construct a mental model that suggests to you hey plants are usually green they may not always be green but you get this model about how plants are and some of the characteristics that all plants might share so if you go to a brand new place and you see some green stuff growing out of the ground you probably have a mental model that's going to suggest to you it's probably a plant. Now it may not be, and you may investigate that, but that's where you're gonna start. And so as we grow up, we make connections between the things that we learn and we build larger, larger chunks of knowledge. And then as we go out into the world and have new experiences and do new things, we use that knowledge to understand what we're seeing. Why are they useful? So this is the Farnham Street Mental Models Toolbox. And we think that mentor models are useful because they help you make sense of the world around you. But one of the things at Farnham Street that we like to do is we like to play with models. So a lot of times what happens in school, what I remember anyway, is that you learn science in science class and you learn math in math class and you learn English in English class. But at least when I was in school, I think it's changing a little, but it's it's hard to take what you learn in science and apply it to English. And it's hard to take what you learn in math and apply it to gym. But the truth is, is the, the, the fundamentals, like the things that are true in math can actually help you in gym, right? If you know angles, angles are mathematics, you can really play pool a lot better, you know? Um, that really helps you. <laughs> so, what we want to do in Farnham Street is we want to take some mental models that we think have a lot more use than just the subject that they come from. And we want to help people learn them and we want to share what we found out about them. So you can put them in your mental models toolbox. And then when you're going around and you discover something new in the world or you're going through a challenge or you have questions, you can pull out your toolbox and you can try using different models to solve your problem or to give you ideas. So I actually, I'm kind of a very literal person and I think of mental models like extremely literally as a lens. So when I'm thinking about using mental models, I think of having this like really funky hat that has this little attachment for a lens. And I can go pick up that lens of a model and put it into my attachment and then look at the world and see what I see. 
And if I don't find anything super useful, I take that lens out and I try a new one. And that's literally how I use models. I put one in my brain and I look at the situation that I'm in and then I say, okay, what can I learn? What have I seen differently? Um, so today I'm gonna cover six models. We have about a hundred at Farnham Street, but I've picked six that A, I really like, and B, I think can be really helpful for kids your age in terms of learning models and understanding how they work and that can actually help you guys um, maybe figure out some stuff in your own lives. So before I go to my next slide, I would like everybody to imagine four places that they wanna go on vacation. So think about like four really cool different vacations that you'd wanna have and four places. And it doesn't have to be countries. It could be like, you wanna to go to an amusement park or you wanna go hiking in the rainforest. But if you could think of four different vacations that you'd wanna have, okay? Okay, so our first model is inversion. Inversion is a super great model because it's super easy. You can use it in two ways and it helps you pretty much all of the time. So when I asked you to imagine where you wanna go on vacation, one of the things that happens when somebody asks us, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna do with your life? What do you wanna be when you grow up? What's your favorite anything? Is when you have too many choices, it can be really overwhelming, right? So where do you wanna go on vacation? Well, I really like this place. Like I think I'd have a lot of fun at Universal Studios, but I also really want to do go zip lining through the rainforest. And you know what? I really love going to the beach and I love snorkeling. So when you have all these different ideas of things you wanna do and they all sound equally great, it's like, well, how do I make that decision, right? So one of the things you can do with inversion is you can imagine yourself going to the end, right? You go to the end, you've had this amazing vacation and you're coming back from this vacation and you're telling everybody about it. What do you tell them? What do you tell them about what you did or how you felt or who you went with? And that can help you work backwards to decide what kind of vacation you should choose this time. So one, I'm gonna work through an example with you guys and then, um, and then you can try to use it for your vacation one. But for instance, one of the things that I do at Farnham Street, like I said, is I work on the mental models books. And when we were working on the first book, well, we'll actually, before we started working on it, when we decided to write the first book, we had this thing that every author has to deal with, which is called a blank page, right? When you wanna fill a blank page as a writer, there are tons of different ways to do it. You know, fiction, nonfiction, do you write science fiction? Do you write a mystery? What kind of story do you wanna tell? Does it have description? What kind of characters? Where are you gonna set it? There's so many choices when you're starting a book that it can be absolutely overwhelming. So one of the things that I did when we were starting the first Great Mental Models book is I went to the end. I imagined that the book was done and that it was printed and that a bunch of people had bought it and they were getting it and it was arriving in their homes and they were opening up this book. And I thought to myself, okay, what kind of experience do we want them to have? And so Sheen and I talked about that and that was how we started the process of like, we have all these choices of how to do a mental models book. How do we come up with the mental models book that works for us? So two things we decided right away when we, when we thought about somebody opening the book is we thought, you know what, we want it to be, if they read it next year or 50 years from now, we want it to be equally useful. And then we also decided we wanted it to be pretty. And so when you make those first two choices based on your end vision, well, that's the beginning of working backward. So when we decide we want the book to be pretty, chances are we're not gonna have just black and white, like black text on white pages and a small little paperback, because that's not pretty. It's useful and there's a lot of great books that come in that format, but that's not what normally people would describe as pretty, right? So we thought, okay, what does it mean for a book to be pretty, right? Probably it has some colors, probably it has some images, and so when we started making those choices, we could work back to, okay, what's our next step on design? 
And the same thing happened when we thought about people being able to read it 50 years from now. If you want people to be able to read a book 50 years from now and have it be just as interesting as it is today, you probably shouldn't have examples that are really specific to what's happening in the world today, right? Um, I maybe wouldn't want to write about like how Twitter is this great new technology or TikTok is taking over the world because 50 years from now, there's probably not going to be a Twitter or a TikTok. And so that isn't going to mean the same thing to somebody in 50 years that it means now. So once you make these decisions, my point is, is that you work backwards to get to your beginning. So when we worked backwards on that, we decided we wanted to use historical examples that were old enough now that they're still going to be relevant 50 years from now. Like you talk about something they learned, like that the Greeks learned 2000 years ago, 50 years doesn't make a lot of difference. So, um, so when you're thinking about something like your vacation, that's why I asked you guys to think of like, where would you want to go? So what you do if your parents ever say, hey, you know what, you, you son, you can pick our next vacation. <laughs> You can use this process. You can think, okay, like, what do I want this vacation to be like? Am I there with my family? Do I have my own bedroom? Do we all have our own television in the hotel? Or are we sleeping in a tent? Because I really like that. And as soon as you make these different choices, that's going to tell you a lot about the kind of vacation you want to have, right? So the other really cool thing about inversion that's kind of similar but is a different way to use it is that Avoiding the bad is one way to be good. So when you think about being good, sometimes it's really hard to know how to be good in certain situations. Like, how do you be a good friend? Well, all of your friends are kind of different, right? Usually. So what one friend thinks is amazing is probably not what another friend thinks is amazing. So how do you know how to be a good friend or a good sibling? Or even something like, let's say you have a life goal that you want to be really rich when you're older. Well, what does that mean? Like, how do you get good at, at, at being rich? How do you make those decisions? So inversion can also be used to show you ways to not do something. So if you think about it this way, let's say your question is like, I, I don't really know how to be a good friend, right? I'm not really sure what it means to be a good friend. But chances are, inversion shows us, that you have a pretty good idea of what it means to be a bad friend, right? Because you know what would hurt you, right? So if you talk behind their back or you say really mean things to them or you avoid talking to them or you make fun of them, that's bad. And you know that you wouldn't want that to happen to you. So Sometimes if you don't know how to be a good friend, you can just say to yourself, well, how do I be a bad friend? And then don't do those things, right? Um, I tell, actually, I use this with my kids a lot. Like sometimes it's not easy for them to know how to be good, good brothers, right? I have two sons and it's like they have different interests and they're really different ages. So what does it take to be a good brother? They're not entirely sure sometimes, but it's pretty obvious how to be a bad brother, you know? Like if you hit each other, <laughs> that's being pretty bad. So if you don't do the bad things, that's one way to be good. And the same thing when you have a, like a out there life goal, like you wanna be famous or you wanna be rich, you may not know how to do those things, but you know how to not do those things, right? Like if you don't ever save any money, you're never gonna be rich. So that's just one thing. If you just avoid the bad thing of spending every single cent that you make, you're at least giving yourself the option to make good choices later on. So this is what I love about inversion. So that was mental model number one. On to mental model number two, relativity. Okay, you know what, I gotta be honest with you, I love all mental models, so I'm gonna say that about every single one, but relativity is also really, really cool. So the whole point behind relativity, and it's, it's based in the physics of relativity, but we don't need to get into that. The point to make today is that everybody has a different perspective. And the more you can learn about what others see, the more information you'll have to make a good choice. So if you look at this picture here, there's six people and they're standing around an elephant. Now, what you don't know about these people is every single one of them is blind. So you have six blind people and they're walking up to an elephant and they're all touching different parts. 
So one woman is touching the side of the elephant and she's like, is, have I hit this some weird wall? And a guy, this other guy's touching the tusk and he's like, is this a spear? Another person's touching the trunk thinking, have I, is this a snake? Like, this is kind of weird. A person's touching the ear. Is it a fin? Is it a tree? Is it a rope? And so they're all, they all have these little bits and they're all learning something about the elephant, but they're not all learning the same thing. And what they don't know from the one part that they're touching is that they're touching an elephant. So the idea here is that if you can share with each other about the different parts of your that you're seeing to a puzzle, you can probably learn more to make a better decision. Because like the guy who's just touching the trunk, if he thinks he's touching a snake, maybe he's like, ah, I need to run away, I need to get out of here. But if he learns that he's touching an elephant, and let's say he's in a zoo, he's like, okay, like I don't, I'm not, I don't have to worry about getting wrapped up and eaten by this thing, right? So the more you learn about what other people are seeing, the better decisions you can make about what's in front of you. And then the other really important thing about relativity is that you can't always assume that what you see is the whole picture and it kind of plays off the elephant, right? So not only can they share information to learn more, they're better off if they know going in that they're not seeing the whole thing. So then they're gonna look around and say, what else can I learn? So I have a little tiny YouTube clip to show. I know we have to go through a skip ad first, but it's only 30 seconds. And I really want you guys to see this. So let me just pull this up. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, it's just loading. Sorry. But it's meant to show you guys about how we can make a lot of mistakes when we don't take the time to look at the full picture. Okay. So I'm just skipping through the ad right now, if you could bear with me. Oh, here we go. Oops. Mom, you need to unshare your screen and reshare it because we can't see it. Yeah, can you see it now? No. No. You need to unshare, then reshare. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so this is a really, really old video, okay? It's from like 1986. What? Okay, here we go. Oh. Did did you guys see all of that or did it freeze a little? It was a little frozen. Do you want to try again maybe it maybe if it's loaded once or Yeah. Okay, I'll try that one more time cuz I think it's pretty cool if we can just see it. Oh, okay. I have this issue all the time. <laughs> that was better, right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, let me go back to sharing my wonderful mental models here. Um, so the point about that video is like, when you first watch it, right, you're kind of like, who is this guy? Why is he running down the street? You can tell the car's pulling up. Are they chasing him? Is he running away from the people in the car? Oh, just a sec. I'm not really super great with technology and I've just left the video on. So just, <laughs> just a second. No worries, no worries at all. There we go. Okay, that's better. Okay, 
So you don't know if he's running away from the guys in the car, like, is he just committed a crime? Are they chasing him? And the woman on the street, she's just like, who's this guy running past me? Should I be scared? And then he jumps up at that man and you think, is he mugging this guy? Like, what's going on? And especially because of the way he looks, right? We, we pass judgment. He's a young guy. He's got kind of a shaved head, grubby baggy clothes. But, oh my gosh, no, he's just saving that man from a bunch of bricks falling on him. So the point about relativity is that you can't always know everything about a situation, and I'm not suggesting that that's where you need to get to, but if you just give yourself a little bit more time to kind of take a look around and see what else is going on and imagine things from different people's perspectives, then you can really learn a lot and probably make a better decision and just feel better about what's going on. So, um, one of the ways you can do, uh, you can get more relativity into your life is diversity. So if you have friends who um, are from different places or interested in different things or have different beliefs than you, it's actually a really good thing. You don't only want to be around people who think like you and act like you and like the same things that you do because then you get this kind of distorted idea where you think that's all there is. But if you can share with people who have different perspectives, you're naturally going to include more of that in your life. And then asking people about their perspectives. Like I actually think a really fun one is to ask people from different countries what they think of Canada or what they think of living in Ottawa. Because I'm Canadian, I've been here my whole life. So I have like a really specific inside view of what it means to be Canadian. And it's super fascinating when you talk to people from other countries and the things they noticed about Canada that I don't even see anymore. Um, so the next one, the next model is Hanlon's razor. And it's kind of related to relativity, which is why I put it right after. Hanlon's razor is a very specific type of perspective. And the gist of it is that most people aren't mean, they're just ignorant. So if you think of it this way, the classic example is in a car. And for parents, it's usually like when we're driving down the road and somebody cuts us off and we're just like, you jerk. Why did you just cut us off? That was so rude. But if you're a kid, you can think of this in multiple ways, right? Like you're riding your bike down the street and the same thing happens. You're, you're riding your bike, you have a green light, you're going, and this car just makes a turn in front of you. And you're probably scared a little and you jump back and your reaction is, wow, that guy is such a jerk. Like, why did he do that? But the truth is, is most of the time that person is probably not a jerk. They just didn't see you, right? I'm not saying that makes it right. I'm just saying that that's what's probably going on. And when we assume the worst thing about people, we tend to put ourselves in like the victim. So now we're the victim because there's this bad person and they've done something bad and we're the victim. And what that means is that we actually can't come to solutions. We can't solve problems if we put ourselves in the, the position of a victim. So, one way that I thought maybe this would relate to something that you guys deal with is let's say you're in school and you're doing a group project. And as you go through school and you do more group projects, you realize one of the challenging group projects is getting everybody to put in the same effort and to do the same amount of work. It's not easy, right? So imagine you do this group project and the teacher says, okay, you guys are presenting on Thursday. And so you do all this work and you work really hard and you take it seriously. And then you get, you, 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 Thursday comes and you get to school and you go to present and your partner hasn't done their work. They haven't prepared and you feel terrible. You're really angry at them. The teacher's like, well, guys, like it was a group project and you didn't deliver. So you both get really bad grades. Now you could assume that your partner was being mean that they were doing this just to piss you off and give you a bad grade. But the chances are is they probably weren't. Now, you may not know them well enough to ask them, but one of the things that I do, and I've done this with my kids, and we're gonna do it right now, it's a really fun activity called imagining people's stories. So one of the things you can do to get out of this people are jerks being mean to me thing is you can imagine other people's stories and what else could be going on for them. So and I'm, when I'm, I'm noticing that I'm talking a little bit more uh, than I realized. So we're going to just take like maybe 20 seconds each when you, when I call on you to do this. So 
So you see this picture here, you've kind of been staring at it as we've been going through Hanlon's razor and you're like, what on earth does this picture have to do with what she's talking about? So what we're gonna do is I want you to look at this picture and I'm gonna call on you one at a time and I'm gonna start with Milo because I gave him a heads up that he'd have to do this. And I want you to just give me like two or three sentences about what you think this woman is doing. We're gonna imagine her story. So Milo. Um, she's an employee. She's an employee at um, a place that makes vases, and um, the or the owner has just gone um, on vacation, and she's second in command. So now she owns it, and he's given her a bunch of stuff to do, and she's just working full time because she's stressed about not having enough time. So that's like a legit story, right? Maybe that's why she's looking a little bit angry. You know, maybe she's just like, man, I got all this work dumped on me. Um, okay, so I'm gonna call on the rest of you and I know all your names because I've been listening for eight weeks. So next up is Lex. Can you tell me what you think this woman's doing? Is he there? Okay. Um. It's sort of hard to tell. Yeah, it's totally hard to tell. And you can make up any, like, two sentences, anything you want about anything she might be doing. Or where <laughs> she's at or anything. So she's, she's a housemaid, and, and she's been left alone for the weekend. And she doesn't have any time to do anything. So she's trying to rush it all and get it all done in one day. Cool. Cool. Okay, next up is Mac. Can you tell me what you think she's doing? Um, I think she's making supper and she's a slave that's working for her boss. Okay, and Rowan? I think she's part of a bakery and it's really early in the morning. Okay, and finally Will. I think that she's cleaning something because She's the janitor for the bakery that's there. Okay. So you see five kids looking at this picture come up with five slightly different stories, right? And my point of doing this for you is that that is true of absolutely everybody, right? Everybody has something going on that you may not realize. And we can probably look at anybody's actions and come up with at least three different ways of explaining them, if not more. So when you have somebody who does something that you think is really mean, and I'm not saying to just take it, sometimes people are mean, and that could be the conclusion that you come to. But what I'm saying is that it can really help to think about it and try imagining a couple different stories to explain their behavior. And actually, this is just a really fun activity to do on car rides as well. Like you see random people walking down the street and you can have a really good time imagining like, their backstory and how they got there and what they're doing. Um, okay, so that's it for Hanlon's razor. Milo, do you mind muting yourself now, honey? Thank you. Okay, the next up is cooperation. Cooperation is a model that um, actually the, the background of it comes from biology. Um, so you guys know what you're looking at here, this picture? Does anybody have any, has anybody seen something like this before? Yes. Okay. Milo, would you like to tell me a little bit about it? Um, there's a type of crab and a type of sea urchin. Since the crab can't defend itself and the sea urchin can't get food, the crab get, the crab takes the sea urchin on its back and gives the sea urchin food in exchange for the sea urchin defending the crab from enemies. Okay, that is exactly it. So this is an example of cooperation in nature and this happens all the time, right? And the idea behind this kind of cooperation in nature is that no one organism can do everything on its own and be prepared for every change that might happen in its environment. 
So organisms who, are, who don't get a lot of help tend to be really specialized. But as soon as things change, and like we're in a huge climate change right now, and as soon as the climate starts to change, organisms that are really specialized have a hard time adapting and therefore surviving. But organisms that can cooperate with other ones to get things that they don't have and then give things to other organisms that those other organisms don't have, they have a lot more choices. So one of the ways that this can kind of apply to your own life is that, and it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about in things like relativity, right? Like, and, and this comes up in mental models all the time, especially the biology ones, but a lot of them, is diversity is amazing. The more people you have in your life who are different, who have different skills, different ideas, different ways of looking at problems, different ways of solving things, different interests, the better off you are because you can learn from them and you can get knowledge and take on things that you wouldn't be able to do if you were just trying to figure out everything on your own. The other thing about cooperation though, is you'll see I put it at the bottom, it's a win-win. So you have to give something too. And that's the other thing to remember about yourselves. You all are unique and you all have ideas and skills that you can share with other people that they don't have. One of the things we often do is we think, and I mean, we all do this. I do this all the time. You think everybody's kind of like you, you know, everybody's like generally got the same skills or whatever that you have. And the fact is that's not true. We see that at Farnham Street all the time, actually. And one of the reasons we work so well together as a team is because we all are really good at different things. And we're all interested in learning from each other. So um, that's one of the things I love about cooperation. Um, I'm not going to go on too much more about cooperation because I, I just think the visual kind of explains it all. But again, it's just to remind you that if you are having trouble with something or you have an idea that you want to do something, like another place this comes up a lot is you'll see in a lot of businesses, there's people who um, generate like the ideas and the creativity and like develop the products. And then there's people who execute the business. Right. So there's a lot of times when you, you come across areas where people have different skill sets and they know that about each other and then they work together, they partner together and they work together to accomplish things. Yeah. So that's cooperation. Okay. The next two are from math. So the first one from math is algebraic equivalence. So if you look at the picture, I don't want you to focus on the words equality and equity. I couldn't modify the picture. I'm going to use different words, but I'm going to get across the same point. So one of the things we learn from algebraic equivalence is that being the same is not being equal. You can be equal and you can be different at the same time, right? So if you look at the first picture, all the three guys who want to watch the baseball game, they all get a box. It's the same. But you know what is not the same? The experience that they're having, right? Because like one of them can't even see it. In the second picture, they all have different amounts of boxes, but they're having an equal experience. They're all getting to watch the game and enjoy it. So if you think about this, like one of the things that comes up a lot, I've thought a lot about models in the context of parenting too. And one of the things that comes up in our house is that, for example, somebody sends in like an aunt or a grandparent will send in like a boatload of candy, right? And it's like, well, one kid will say, well, he got two, I want two. Or he got three, I want three, right? It's like everybody wants to share. Um, Lex, would you mind just muting yourself? Thanks. So. But the thing is, is what the question that we actually could be asking in our homes is not do we each get the same amount of candy, but do we have an equal experience? Because honestly, like I know with Milo's dad, he and I treat candy totally differently. I love to chew it. So I'll go through like 20, but he likes to suck on candies. So he'll go through like two. In the time it takes me to eat 20, he'll go through two. But we don't worry about that. He doesn't say to me, well, you need to save me a whole bunch because I need to have the same amount as you. 
we're talking about having an equal experience. We're both enjoying ourselves, and that's really more important than that we each get the same amount of skills in the pack, right? Um, so the thing that's really cool about algebraic equivalence, if you build on this idea, is that there are many ways to solve a problem and that there is usually more than one right answer, right? So if you look at this equation here, I don't know how far into algebra you guys are in school, but x minus 6 times x plus 3 equals 0. So in this equation, x can equal 6 or it can equal minus 3. Either of those numbers are going to work and they're going to give you the 0. So you can tell just from a visual check that 6 and minus 3 are not the same number, right? They are not the same. But in this equation, they give you an equal result. They both get you to zero. And so one of the ways like we talk about that in our mental models books, for instance, is if you look at the history of invention. There's a ton of inventions that actually two different people in two different places who had no contact with each other came up with at the same time. They used a different path to get there but no one was one was more right than the other. They didn't do it the same way and they didn't use the same equipment, but they got an equal result. So the point about algebraic equivalence is that if you focus on being the same, sometimes you miss opportunities. But if you focus on being equal, it, it kind of frees up your brain that you can think, well, how can I do it in a way that's good for me where I get an equal result? Like, um, if you think about like as a parent, I want to make sure that both my kids kind of develop like, you know, certain skills and have good childhoods and et cetera, et cetera. But I know like my boys are really different. They're interested in different things. They like different things. They get excited about different things. So I'm not going to make them play the same sports or do the same activities because that's not what I'm after. What I'm after is that they have an equal experience, that they get to try things they like, that they get to master something, that they find that they're passionate about something, that they feel like they each had an equally good childhood experience. But I know that it's gonna be different for each of them. But there are many ways to get to the end. Um, so when you think about that, you know, you want to get somewhere, you can look at what other people have done, but you always want to make sure you leave an option open, which is that there's usually more than one right answer to any problem. So that's algebraic equivalence. So the last one is called global and local maxima. Now I apologize in advance, I'm ending with the one that has the least interesting picture. I know that. But um, this isn't like a super, it isn't even like was in a super concept I was aware of, so I thought I really need to put in the actual graph. So the graph that you're looking at shows it's, I'm not going to go into the math, mostly because it's not math that I particularly um, super understand either. But the idea is that there, if you have different equations, the, the results, the results for an equation can go on a graph like this where you have ups and downs, highs and lows. Now a global maximum and a global minimum are the top and bottom values that that equation will produce. You can't go any higher than a global maximum and you can't go any lower than a global minimum. So life, the reason I like this model is life is a lot like this, right? You have ups and you have downs and we all go through them and it's really normal. But one of the questions sometimes you face, especially like in your career or when you're studying something, is like, how do I know when I'm at a global maximum, which is the best I can possibly do, or I'm at, I'm at a local maximum, right? So the local maximum is like, hey, it's kind of good, especially if you look at that one on the right, the far right. I mean, it's okay, it's in the positive, but there are better local maximums out there and there's even a global maximum. So one of the things I really like about this graph and this way of thinking and using this model is that sometimes you have to go down to get back up. Like if you look at the first local maximum, it's not like you can go from that local maximum to the global one. You have to go down to this global minimum, which is probably a really crappy place, in order to get like the skills or the experience or the ideas you need to go back up to the top. So one of the 
um, places I see this come up a lot when I'm reading history books is when people are starting businesses. So usually, like, let's say you have an idea for a product, okay? We'll call it like a widget. And you have this idea for this amazing widget and it's gonna change the world. So when you're starting out, the first thing you're doing is you're just designing the widget. You're just trying to figure out, you're making one, you're making a prototype and you're figuring out how to make it work. And you're gonna try and you're gonna fail and you're gonna try and you're gonna fail. And eventually you're gonna be like, yes, I have it. I have my widget, I'm, I'm making it work. I go get my patent, fantastic. But then what? Like you've become an expert at making a widget. What you're not an expert yet is how to make 10,000 of those widgets, how to sell them, um, you know, how to market them. You don't know those things. All you know is making the widget. So you're like, okay, what comes next? Well, let's say it's production. So then you have to go down. You have to go down. You have to say, okay, I know nothing about producing widgets. So who can I find to teach me about producing widgets? And you go and you learn how to produce them and you make mistakes. And then you climb back up to another local maximum and you're like, okay, I can produce 10,000 of these things every day. This is great. Oh my God. How do I sell them? I can't sell all these myself. So then you go back down and you find salespeople and you learn from them. And so it's this constant process of having to say, you know what? I don't know this. I can't do this right now. I need to get help. I need to learn. And you go back down that curve until you can climb up again and then become a master of selling widgets. The other place where you see often to get really good at something, you may have to be bad at something for a while, is sport. I've read so many stories of like people, let's say like golfers or tennis players. So a golfer, you can imagine there's this golfer and she's really good and she's on the LPGA and she's getting in the top five but she can't like break to the top. She can't win a tournament. So she hires a new coach. Well, the coach comes in and says, well, with that swing, you, yeah, you can be number five in the world, but if you wanna be number one in the world, we gotta change your swing. Now, if you have a golfer who's been doing the same swing for 10 years and all of a sudden she's gotta change it, let me tell you, her learning curve goes, her, her, her maximum curve goes down really strong, really quick, because she's got to master this whole new swing. But then once she does, she gets better at it and better at it and better at it, and she reaches a new high. Now she can easily win a tournament. So it happens a lot in sports. It happens a lot in music. If you think of your favorite band and you do research on them, chances are you're going to find out that all of the people in your favorite band were in other bands before they got in the band they're in now, right? And that maybe there were different people in the group. Like you have this music group and they're playing good and they're getting some gigs and maybe a record deal, but they're like, they're not, they're not nailing it. They're not getting this super amount of success. So they look and they say, you know what? It's our bass player. He's got to go. He's just not good enough to play bass. And then you get a new bass player and that guy, he's got to learn the notes. He's got to learn the songs and you guys have to figure out to work with him. And he's got some different tricks that you don't really know. And so you've gone down again, you've, you've gone, you've got to relearn you to get back up to that top. So that's one I like because I think that sometimes we think that we just keep, once we know something, we just keep going and we just keep getting better and better and better and more and more and more. And actually that's not true. In order to get really good, we often go through periods where we have to just go right back down to the bottom and say, I've got to start again and work my way up even higher. And so the message in this is don't be afraid to start new things. A very personal story, but one I think is super great, is my stepfather was really good at sports and he played football and he played hockey, but when he was 31 years old, he said, you know what? I'd really like to try steer wrestling. And then if you play hockey or football, you are not ready to be a steer wrestler. I mean, he could barely ride a horse. But at 31 years old, he went out and he figured out how to ride a horse and he figured out how to use a lasso, which believe me is really difficult. And he figured out how to come out of the gate and wrap that lasso around three legs of a cow that was running and jump off his horse and flip it on his back. And he started that at 31 and he actually made it to the professional rodeo. So it's never too late to try new things. It's never too late to say, hey, I may suck at this, but I'm going to take the time now to get better because you just don't know where it's going to take you. 
So that is it, guys. Those are the six mental models that I think are really interesting and can help you improve your life. So one of the things I asked Julia to do is to ask you guys to prepare a question because I know sometimes when people come across the term mental models, they're like, what is that? What does it mean? So I'd really like to hear your questions now about anything that I've talked about or anything that you thought when you read that mental model sheet earlier that you'd like to ask. Milo? You're muted. Um. Go ahead, my love. Um, I, I have, I'm not muted. So I have two questions, and the first one is, because you said mental models are how we understand the world. Not only do they shape what we think and what we understand, but they shape the connections and opportunities we see. And then I'll just skip down to one of the paragraphs. A mental model is simply a representation of how something works. We cannot keep all the details of the world in our brain, so we use mental models to simplify the complex into understandable and organizable chunks. Um, my question is, what if one of those or two of those or all of those chunks are too big to learn? Then you just keep breaking them down into smaller chunks. And that's what we try to do at Farnham Street, right? So you can't learn everything, but what we try to look for are broad ideas that you can chunk a lot of things into. So if you're, if you're overwhelmed by the amount of information that you're trying to take in, you just try to make your chunk bigger and bigger so it fits more things. Like cooperation is like a giant chunk, right? It comes from biology and it's huge, but there's a lot of things that you can pack into that chunk. My second question is, like you said, you use toolbox mental, but let's say your toolbox is too small. How do you make your toolbox bigger? So that is just practice. So your toolbox, it's like a magic toolbox. Like, you know, in Harry Potter, they had that bag where like they could just keep putting stuff into it and it just like, you could basically put a whole city in it, but it was still the size of a bag. That's the toolbox of Farnham Street. That toolbox grows, the more you put in it, the more it'll expand in order to fit what you put in it. Okay, Mac? Um, why don't you suck on candy? I just don't <laughs> like to. I mature. I like to, like, crack it. <laughs> it would be too, so much healthier for you. I know, and that's why I don't eat it, because I know my problem. <laughs> Um, anybody have a, one of the questions they thought of earlier? I know you wrote them down, so. Yeah, so everybody should be opening up um, that reading worksheet that we did right before our break. Will, I remember you had some great questions. Why don't you share one of them? I'm not on my computer right now. So Lex, you mentioned that there were some parts of the text that you weren't completely sure what, um, what was meant by them. Do you want to talk about that? I don't remember which one it is and my document is not pulled up. Okay, well you guys should be pulling up your documents right now and opening up your questions so that you can ask Rhiannon while she's with us right now. Okay. So this is 
people start with bigger tool boxes and why? Um, I think that a lot of people start with the toolboxes that they get in school. I think that's the place that most of us start. And so, yes, across the world, there's a huge difference in what kids get from school. I have to say that we're pretty lucky in Canada. We have a school system that the population takes seriously and tries to invest in to give kids as many tools as possible. Now, you know, different schools are different and different teachers are different. But you can imagine that in some places, like if kids have to start working on their parents' farm at seven or eight years old, they're not getting a chance to put as much into their toolbox as kids like you who are going to go to school like at least until you're 20. So it really depends on where you're from and where you live. Um, that's, a, that's how you start with your toolbox. But one of the things that's really important to Shane and really important to Farnham Street is that we don't think that people should necessarily be stuck where they start. And so we think that, like we try to make all of our mental model stuff available and eventually our books are gonna be free because we want people to get excited about learning and we think this kind of knowledge is like for the world. So you can always make your toolbox bigger is like the short answer to that. Lex? What does it mean to array your experience to what? Array your experience. Was that on the page? Yeah. To array your experience. Hmm. Okay, let me look for that. What's the whole sentence, Lex? Um, you've got to array your experience both the serious and direct on this latest work of models. Oh, the lattice work. Yeah, it's the Charlie Munger. You've got to array your experience both vicarious and direct on this. <laughs> yeah, that's Charlie Munger. So I don't want to like, you know, <laughs> assume that I know what he meant by that. I'll tell you what I understand by that which is that Charlie Munger's thing, and so this is what we follow at Farnham Street, is that mental models are more useful the more you connect them together. And how you connect them is what we call the lattice work, and we get that right from Charlie Munger. So do you guys know what a lattice is? So when you go to like gardens, you see them, it's like a fence in a diamond shape. You know, it's just like a series of diamonds and that makes up the fence. That is a lattice. And so all those diamonds are connected to each other. And that's what we talk about the lattice work. So when Charlie Munger is saying that you've got to array your experience on this lattice work, he's saying you've got to put your models into a framework. You, you're gonna do better if you don't just learn one model and then like keep it separate. But if you say, okay, now that I've got this model, how does it connect with other models? Because as you get more into mental models later on, I'll just let you know, I don't expect you to take this on, is that you'll start to see that some usually come up together. So if one model is useful in one type of situation, you're probably going to see a couple other ones come up at the same time that will also be useful. So that's what the lattice work means. And that would, that's what it means to array your experience on it, is to just place it and say, OK, this, this experience matches well with this and this and this. So I make these connections. So next time I'm in a situation, like this is Charlie Munger's thing. He's like 93 years old, right? And every time he's in a new situation, he's like, okay, what have I seen before? What's familiar about this situation? And then what, what have I used before in similar situations? And he just pulls all that in from his lattice work and applies it to his situation. Okay, I think that's it, unless you guys have any other questions. Will's good. Oh, Will has a question? Does he? Or is this bear I talking? He does. <laughs> what is your favorite part about mental models? My favorite what about mental models? Part. Oh, my favorite part is that, um, oh, there's so many favorite parts. One of the things I really love is that they make me a more thoughtful person. I have to say that for me, mental models, the first place I started to apply it was as a mom. 
And I think that I'm a much better mom because I've learned mental models. So like with relativity, one of the ones I taught you, like I think a lot of times before when, uh, let's say Milo's little brother Zane would like have a temper tantrum when he was like two, I'd get like really upset and be like, oh my God, this kid, he's driving me crazy. Oh no. But then I'd be like, okay, once I learn relativity, I'd be like, okay, well, what's going on in his brain? Why is he reacting like this? Am I contributing to this situation? What can I do differently to get a different reaction from him? So I love mental models because they made me a better mom and they're also helping me make better long-term decisions about my future. But also I think they're a lot of fun. I think that it's fun. It's fun for me to learn things like in chunks like this. And then plus I get to write the book. So I get to like dive deep into them and I get to read all these amazing history books. And then I get to see patterns throughout history and it's a lot of fun. Okay, well, you guys have been great. Thank you so much. I know this wasn't the most stimulatingly exciting topic that you saw on your list for the week, mental models, but you guys have been really good. I hope you liked it. You did an excellent job. This was awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much. You're